I'm Todd Jones, recovering from 30 years as a sports writer. Thanks for joining me as I sit down with some of the best sports writers of our time who knew the greatest athletes and coaches and experienced firsthand some of the biggest sports moments of the past half century. We'll share stories behind the stories, some we've only told each other. Pull up a seat on Press Box Access. John McGrath is the only sports writer I know who worked on a railroad for a year. If you know John, that's no surprise. He was always one to follow his curiosity, which led to great stories and columns. And everywhere John went, there was a glint of mischief in his eyes. No wonder we ended up sharing a few rounds in a few towns in a few time zones. I'm glad to catch up with him again. John's been through some difficult health challenges. In 2020, he overcame liver disease after being told he had six months to live. And early this year, John was hit by a pickup truck while walking across the street. Three compound fractures in his left arm, broken ribs, broken foot. He's doing much better now, walking again and witty as ever. Let's go for a ride through John's colorful career. All aboard. John, welcome to Pressbox Access. It's great to reconnect. Great to see you, Todd. Yeah, it's been a while. Well, you look like you're in some kind of bomb shelter or cedar closet or something. <laughs> Where are you sitting at, John? Actually, I'm in my son's uh, cellar, which is a good place uh, in case there's a nuclear war outside. I think we're in good shape. <laughs> it does look like a scene from Breaking Bad, though, doesn't it? I, yeah. I, uh, uh, but everything sounds good, and you look great, and, and looking forward to the conversation. Well, you're only seeing me from the neck up, and I don't even know if that looks great, yeah. but we'll go from there. So I'm just so glad to... Uh, to reconnect. It's been a while. This is really John McGrath, right? The sports columnist at the Tacoma News Tribune for 27 years. Let me check. Yeah, yeah. Uh, same one. All right. We've got that confirmed because you ju- you disappeared on me, John. Uh, you took that buyout in 2018. I've been searching for you, combing the Pacific Northwest like I was looking for Bigfoot. <laughs> yeah. Well, Bigfoot would be one uh, way to call it. There were a few nights on the road with you, John, where I did think I saw a Sasquatch. Yeah. Yeah, it was fun, uh, Todd. You know, just just looking back, you know, some of the ball players or athletes, they'll tell you that what they miss most about their careers is not so much the winning and the losing and the ups and downs and the competition, which is all obviously what they live for and played for, but just the camaraderie, you know, just being with friends. And who turned into lifelong friends right. and being there every day. Um, and they miss all that. You know, they, they retire, they go their separate ways. And uh, a lot of times they don't even talk to each other for years and years. Maybe they hook up at some old timers convention or something. But, uh, you know, it's the friends that you miss the most. In my case, that's certainly true. Well, it's true for me, too. And I really miss seeing you on the road. I mean, I was joking around about searching for you, but you used to be everywhere. Olympics, Super Bowl, World Series, All-Star Games, Final Fours. I always knew if I showed up, John McGrath was probably there sitting near me. Yeah, uh, probably. You know, looking back, it was uh, it was quite a career. And yeah, you named the big sporting event, and I probably had some experience at covering it. And, you know, it, uh, it, was, it was fabulous. It was a front row seat to the greatest sports events of the last, of the last 40 years or so. You know, you talk about a jo- a dream job, that uh, that would be you know in the in the conversation for sure. John, when you think about it, a dream job like that, is there some story that sticks in your mind that maybe kind of speaks to what the job was like, what it was like to do? I was thinking about this the other day, Todd, because I see it so often on on highlights is the Kirk Gibson home run, right? Uh, we famously kind of limped up to the plate and against Deckersley, and um, I was sitting in the auxiliary stands at Dodger Stadium, uh, not the main press box, but for the big events, of course, they have auxiliary seating, and, and it was among the fans. Where was that seating at, John? Where was the auxiliary press box? It was, uh, I want to say, first base side, but it was outside, mm-hmm. and you know, three or four rows in front of me were fans, and three or four rows behind me were fans. And that wasn't uncommon. That would happen at Yankee Stadium or, uh, or you know, around baseball. You, you would be basically sitting in, and it, which was fine because you got almost got a better feel for it than you would be enclosed in a press box. Mm-hmm. But in any case, uh, Gibson gets up there and he hits the home run for the ages. And 
you have the whole Vin Scully description and the gesture by Kirk and everything. And all of a sudden I feel this sort of, it felt like rain, but it wasn't rain because I, you know, it was dry, dry, pleasant fall night and it was beer <laughs> because the, the stands, uh, yeah, everybody was, you know, cheering ecstatic, uh, just this euphoria in the stands and, and uh, they did, I guess, what I would have done if I were a fan is just throw your beer high, as high as you can uh, in celebration with everybody else. But the problem w- w- was, and always has been for me, is you get that any kind of liquid in your keyboard and your story goes fizzle. It's like the Wizard of, of Oz. Remember when the witch gets water on her and I'm melting. Right. Well, you could <laughs> almost see that on your screen too. That it, it, you. you and I, I was, so I was more fearful for my screen and my story. And I was um, looking back at maybe seeing one of the most famous home runs in baseball history. It always, your, your personal saga always took precedence, no matter how dramatic the event. Right. John, I think maybe you should have tilted your head back like a baby bird, <laughs> opened your beak. Right. And just taken in some of those drops falling from the sky. I, you know what, Todd? I think I did. Um <laughs> But to no avail, it was uh, actually, it, it, the keyboard did survive and I was able to file a story. God knows what I wrote. In those, in all, it, all through my career, and I'm sure you've talked to other guys who've told you the same things. Sometimes if your deadline is 9.30, say, or let's just say 9.30, mm-hmm. and it's a tie game at 9.25 with no resolution in sight, now you have to, you know, whoever wins or loot, you just have to be ready to file, boom like that, like a finger snap. So you have to write two different stories. Right. One if you win and one if you lose. And you just make sure you, you press this bright send button uh, yeah. when it's all said and done. Uh, which, by the way, I didn't do a couple of times. Well, you were in Tacoma for nearly three decades. You were also in Chicago at the National, the Denver Post, the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. John, you worked in four time zones. How were you on deadline? Any horror stores besides the Gibson? I was late in every single one of them. <laughs> um, fortunately, and, and for the most part, I had uh, began my career in Columbia, Missouri. That was an afternoon paper. Mm-hmm. And I went to Jackson, Mississippi with afternoon paper. And the Atlanta Journal in those days was an afternoon paper. And the Denver Post had just recently converted to morning. So uh, I uh, by the time I got to mornings, you know, I was pretty, I, I was a little bit better on, on deadline. The afternoon, uh, the afternoon situation, if you were not a, a fast writer, it could linger and linger because you had all this time. Right. And you had 14 hours to do a story. Well, in my case, I would wait 13 and a half hours to get going. Yes. And it was just, um, I, in fact, I remember, Todd, uh, there was a game at Lambeau Field we were covering and it was the playoff game uh, between the Packers and the Seahawks. And uh, snow, as it would happen in Green Bay, started falling around halftime, maybe the third quarter, mm-hmm. and really started falling uh, toward the end of the game. And then we went down to the locker room and got our quotes. The Seahawks had lost in overtime. And I get back up, and these kids, maybe two of them, were carving some sort of initials in the snow. Uh, that was visible from the press box. And somebody remarked, what, what kind of idiots are these? What, what, are, what are they doing down there, these idiots? And I said, hey, don't knock them. They've written more than I have. <laughs> and that was, a, that was about an hour after the game had ended. Yeah, I yeah. remember those afternoon days. I started yeah. the Cincinnati Post in the late 80s and early 90s, and we had those afternoon deadlines too. And I can remember covering a Monday night football game in Houston with the Bengals and Oilers. And that's how old I am, by the way, a franchise that doesn't exist in a stadium that doesn't exist. But anyway, I remember walking out into the Astrodome and the sun was coming up because we didn't have those, those pressing deadlines and we were writing all night. So I, I hear you about procrastinating. I always treated it like they were term papers in college. Yeah, it was, uh, it was a different experience. It really was. And, and it allowed you, especially with the afternoon guys, uh, it allowed you to really... Uh, you could linger around the clubhouse in, in baseball, for instance. You could stay uh, when everybody else had to, or, or the morning guys had to clear out. You could kind of take your time and 
get a little bit more in-depth information. Right. John, do you have a memory of a time where you lingered and it led to something surprisingly great just because you were lingering around? Well, I do remember, or I go back to the Sugar Bowl in New Orleans, and it led to me falling asleep on the hotel floor <laughs> uh, before, I, before I started. And um, because all those temptations in New Orleans, you know, it, it, and well, what the hell, I've got 14 hours or thir- whatever, whatever it was, but it turned out to be a frantic, frantic uh, deadline. Suddenly you were writing, running. Uh, yeah. <laughs> because I had, I had slept. Uh, I was very tired, by the way. At, New Orleans will do that to you. You know, it's, yeah. it'll make you it tired. Did, it, it did to me, yes. <laughs> well, deadline is always something that's fun to talk about with sports writers, especially back in the days before the internet, when you just had to beat beat the presses. You know, the, the pressure was on. And so sometimes some of the greatest things that happen in sports at night were some of our worst memories, right? Yeah. And then the Olympics, you know, would, would completely skewer everything. I don't know. I still don't remember... Um, Sometimes what what time it was I was supposed to be in and and uh, or what day uh, it was a lot of, really I mean sometimes what day it in was, Sydney Australia I was like yeah. is this Tuesday or is it Wednesday right and and I finally got to the point where I think it was around I was on deadline at two or three in the afternoon I think that was the equivalent of eleven I want to say uh, but it took me forever and I was in Barcelona and I finally got you know got it together to where I was able to finish my story uh, sort of on deadline, mm-hmm. but at least it was fresh. You know, the Olympics can be, if you, if you cover it as, as a nine-to-five situation, it, it's, the story's old for right. your readers, right? Right. And, uh, but I do remember kind of perfecting it to the point where I could finish my story and go down to the little bubble bar down there that was open 24 hours and have a nice picture of sangria uh, and relax for the sun, sunrise. Right. Uh, Always good for the transitional sentences. Not, <laughs> not a bad gig. <laughs> you mentioned the Olympics. I think you cover like six of them, John. Um, and we were talking about lingering in the clubhouse. And, and at the Olympics, you could just kind of wander around sometimes and stumble into something unexpectedly magical. I mean, that happened to you a few times, right? Yeah, I remember in one case, Todd, uh, we were at, uh, it was in Beijing, and I was uh, lost. They have these various places where you would, almost like big conference centers, and they would have maybe judo in one room, uh, or one stage, as it were, maybe table tennis in another, mm-hmm. uh, a weightlift, whatever the case might be. Anyway, you I was there to cover somebody from the United States, which we used to call locals, right? I mean, the closer they were to your home paper, the more you were supposed to be interested in them. Right, right. But I couldn't find, I don't know what the hell I was there for, uh, but I couldn't find what I had gone to the conference center for. So I just said, uh, the heck with it. I'll, I'll just walk in here. There's an event starting right now. Mm-hmm. I'll just walk in and see what happens. And it was a women's weightlifting event. And I'm there, not many press were there for sure. There was no American, you know, in, in the finals or whatever. And it was three women you've never heard of. And one of them was right in, you know, all, all the competitors were essentially right in front of me. I had a, like a folding chair. And she was, this one weightlifter was particularly, I mean, her facial expression was galvanizing. I mean, just mesmerizing. I, I, can still see it hmm. and the amount of power, not just power but determination uh it was it was mind blowing and she lifted it and pivoted and lifted it over her head and, and dropped it and she won hmm. she was from colombia and the, there were some writers there and tv people and radio people from colombia they started crying uh, you know, in addition to high fiving and everything else, they started crying. And I asked one of us, "What's going on?" And he said, "Well, this is our first medal. This is our first gold medal ever in the Olympics, and everybody thinks of us as this drug cartel headquarters, which, of course, it has been and maybe always will be. Whatever, 
but this is a moment of pride for all of us. Wow. And it turned out she was the first gold medal winner ever in Colombia and later went into politics down there. I, I, so I wrote, I wrote about just stumbling in, not expecting anything and seeing one of the great sporting events uh, I've ever covered. And that was out of nowhere. That was out of a mistake. I couldn't find what I was supposed to be covering <laughs> and, and walked into that. And that would be, to me, pretty, uh, the, the, the quintessential Olympic moment for me. That's interesting because, again, it, it's nobody you've probably heard of back home. It's nobody that TV's focusing on. And yet, if you're there in the moment, it's an amazing thing to witness. And then you get to write about it and put the people back home in Tacoma with you. Yeah, that's, uh, there was another time, and I think it also was Beijing. Beijing and Sydney, I kind of, uh, and I, I covered them both, and they, I kind of get them confused because it was both a long ways away on, on that crazy time change. But anyway, I'm at the airport. This had to be Beijing. I, uh, you remember some of those post, uh, um, I want to say 9-11 Olympics. Right. The security, the security was unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. You would need a pass to get a credential to get another pass to get another credential. And that got you in this area where you get another credential for another pass. And anyway, I'm waiting at one of these uh, airport shuttle places where you, and this crew, this guy comes over and I look and I see he's from Mongolia and he had a television crew with him. And he comes up to me and he goes, do you mind if I, do you mind if I talk to you? I'm from Mongolian TV. And I said, well, sure. And the people would ask, well, why, what did you tell the Mongolia TV reporters? I said, what I always tell the Mongolian TV reporters. Um, what did you tell them, John? What my expectations were for Mongolia. And I said, well, to tell you the truth, I, I kind of have not been, that's not been prominent on my radar, but I, I, I really wish you guys well. Yeah, I don't think, I don't think Mongolia is going to win the AFC East. But, yeah. You know. <laughs> So, as it turns out, in boxing, that was their first gold medal, and they won a silver medal. And then in judo, I think they won their first gold medal and first silver medal in the country's history. Wow. You're like a good luck charm. You just show up and countries start winning things. Well, this, the boxer who got the silver, I think his left arm, he got a shoulder separation, right? So, he was boxing with one hand. And it was the damn most courageous thing I've ever seen. Wow. You're taking... You're taking, uh, you're, you're in against one of, the, you know, one of the greatest boxes in, on the planet, your size, and you have one hand. And he lasted. He, he took the silver medal. Anyway, I, for, I wrote about that or something. I wrote about, about Mongolia. Because you were such an expert on Mongolia. I mean, yeah. you had to go there. <laughs> yeah. So I get an email from this uh, resident. Of, I assume he was an American living in Mongolia. And I got an email from him and said, hey, this country's gone nuts because the prime minister is on a three-day bender. He was just on TV and he was slurring his words. He couldn't, he just, he was just crazy with uh, ecstasy because Mongolia had four medals. And, uh, and I thought, oh, that's a, that's a nice story. I'm kind of, so ever since then, Mongolia, you know, right on, man. Yeah. Well, he read your <laughs> column and he's like, man, yeah. I, I think I might have to throw a few back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, sometimes the Olympics would just present you with situations like that, a no-name athlete from someplace you really don't know much about. But other times throughout your career, it seems like whatever market you were working in, you always had some superstar athlete that kind of took up a lot of oxygen in that market. And, and I wanted to bring up a few of those guys. And the first guy I want to bring up is somebody we never really talk about or hear about anymore. But you worked in Atlanta in the early 1980s. I think from like 81 to 84. And the Braves weren't any good yet. And, you know, they got Ted Turner owning them. And there's a lot going on down there that nobody's paying attention to. And they had a player named Dale Murphy. And Dale Murphy won back-to-back -back MVPs. And yet, you don't hear about him at all today. I'm struck by the fact that somebody like you covered Dale, you know, quite often in those days. What do you remember about a guy who's kind of fallen off the radar? I know. Uh, I voted for him as long as he was eligible for the Hall of Fame, Todd. And uh, I know everybody has different, uh, every voter has, has different criteria. Uh, in my, 
in my reasoning was that Dale was the best player in baseball two consecutive years. He did not have the longevity stats, but he did play. He did, not like he was one and done. I mean, he was back-to-back MVP in center field, by the way. He was a great center fielder, great hitter, a great leader, a great man. And one of my favorites, win or lose, he was always there to uh, try to give an honest answer and felt sometimes bad. I remember him sometimes coming back the next day and saying, hey, I, 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 I'm not sure my answer was good, as good as you needed last night. Um, <laughs> really? Yeah. Oh, no, he was, he was unbelievable. And you're right, even though the Braves were on WTBS in those days and a lot of the country got them, Dale just kind of faded into the background. And, he had, you know, he kind of resurfaced as a, uh, with the Phillies and, and, and et cetera. But uh, it's too bad that people don't remember that he was as good as he was. Well, you moved on to Denver as a sports columnist at the Denver Post. And in those days, in 84 to 89, the Broncos were, you know, they were it, right? You could write them 24-7, right? Yes. In fact, there was, uh, I mean, there were stories that were actually true of the police, the, the snow, you know, in Denver, it would snow most heavily, uh, actually in like November and in the spring. Um, but before a Broncos game, the players' driveways would be completely shoveled, ready to go. Really? And that everybody else in the neighborhood had to suck it up, you know. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, I, I do remember doing a talk show or listening to a talk show there once when um, uh, Bobby Lane had died. Mm-hmm. And the two hosts were regaling Bobby Lane's stories. Well, Bobby Lane was quite a character and a gambler and a drinker and, and a, you know, just out of a, out of a Hollywood script from 19, 1950s, mm-hmm. 40s and stuff. Right. And he had died and uh, they they laugh and they tell stories and then there's a kind of a pause and then the one of the hosts says, now, more seriously, the Broncos are playing Sunday. And I thought, the guy died. What's right. more serious than a guy dying? But, what a uh, transition. <laughs> <laughs> now we move to more serious matter. Wow. The Broncos, yeah, it, it, was, it, was, quite a, it was quite a trip. And, and uh, a, a lot of, uh, I was there for the obvious the, the the John Elway ninety eight yard drive in in Cleveland. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Let's hear about this, John. So you're there, you're right? Were you down on the field at yes. that point in the game because the media used to be allowed down onto the field in the final minutes of a game. So yes. What was your vantage point of the drive? That, that it went right by me, and that I had no replays, and uh, I had scribbled some notes, but I was so transfixed by the situation that um, I uh, it just kind of happened uh, in a blur. Mm. And then uh, I do remember afterward going back up to the press box and all these Browns fans, it was cold, it was overcast, it was Cleveland in, no, in December or January, I guess it was, right? Mm-hmm. And they were all heckling and booing. And, and I thought, God, um, I really felt for him. You know, I mean, you know, this, just, this is, and it's not so much, I actually like Cleveland and, and had, some fun there, but but the idea of this facing this long, terrible winter and losing the way they lost right. was uh, uh, yeah, I could I could relate to it a little yeah. bit as, as just a person. Well, Elway was certainly in his prime in those days, and if the Broncos were twenty four seven news, Elway was at the eye of the hurricane. As a columnist in those days in the eighties, what was it like to cover somebody like John Elway? Yes, uh, um, it must have been. He was fine, by the way, uh, and uh, and great uh, great talent. But the scrutiny was, I think, suffocating. It had to be for him. The Rocky Mountain News, the other newspaper that we were in competition with in those days, once did a story, a very innocent story about what celebrities in Denver gave for Halloween trick or treat, mm-hmm. right? And. Uh, I think the uh, Elway House gave Reese's peanut butter cups, if I'm not mistaken. Seems reasonable. Yes. Well, as it turns out, he had a 
endorsement deal with Nestle's Crunch or whatever it was. The, the candy they were giving out was not consistent with his endorsement of another candy. He got really mad. Hmm. And I guess I could see, I yeah. could see why, but when, when the candy you're giving at Halloween becomes kind of a, uh, a, a, an event that's covered in the news and becomes actually controversial, you know, you know, the, uh, it's a it's life in the goldfish bowl is is pretty suffocating. Yeah, it's not like he was putting razor blades and bobby pins in them. No, <laughs> <laughs> no. Reese's peanut butter cups. Honest to God. Well, you said he was fine to do with. Could you have conversations with him? Because these days, quarterbacks, you get them like one time on the podium once a week. Was Elway pretty available to deal with and and talk with and try to get to know a little bit? Yeah. Um, the players who, who uh, were his friends, and he had a lot of them, and he had a lot of offensive linemen, and, and John, being a smart guy, knew that, he, you know, if you make friends with anybody on your team, it's going to be the offensive lineman if you're a quarterback, for sure. Uh, he, was a, he was one of those guys that would hang around and have beers with him mm-hmm. and talk, and, and uh, he was one of the boys. Right. Uh, and not so much with us, but uh, but again, he, like I say, he was fine. He wasn't he wasn't uh, evasive or confrontational or anything like that. But uh, to beat John's buddy, you had to be in those days about two hundred eighty five pounds and six foot four, and uh, and give out the right candy at Halloween. Yeah, yeah, exactly. NFL Sunday Ticket is now on YouTube and YouTube TV which means that it just got easier to be an NFL fan, even if you live far away. Like, maybe you like the Bears, but you're hibernating in Panthers territory. But with NFL Sunday Ticket, your out-of-market team is never more than a short distance away, specifically the distance from you to your remote control. NFL Sunday Ticket, now on YouTube and YouTube TV. Go to youtube.com slash presale to get $50 off. Terms and embargoes apply. Offer ends 919. No refund. Subscription auto renews. Well, it's always interesting when a superstar in a market commands so much attention. And, and you experienced that too when you went on to Chicago, when you worked for the National, you know, God bless the National Soul, three years, you know, in 89 to 91, you had a couple guys there that are all-time athletes. Uh, first one, obviously, is Michael Jordan. But you had like the young Michael Jordan, right? I mean, this guy has not yet quite become everything he is now. I'm curious what it was to cover Michael at that point in his career. Yeah, he was still, he was still, uh, you, you like you pointed out, he was up and coming. Uh, obviously, everybody, he'd already had his famous game against the Celtics, the 63 point playoff game. But he was still, uh, the year, the full year I was at the National, and he, he uh, Charles Barkley won MVP that year. And I think just because the voters were tired of giving it to Michael. <laughs> And this is before he became, you know, he had won his first championship. 91 was the year that we disbanded. In fact, we disbanded on the very night the Bulls clinched in Los Angeles for their first of the six. I didn't realize that. The National died on that very night? On that afternoon, yeah. Wow. And uh, and I was told that the Bulls players were down on the court talking about it. And I said, oh, really? And then... Jack McCallum from Source said, uh, "Well, John, they were they weren't they weren't crestfallen or anything. They were just yeah. talking about it. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> they were like taking credit. <laughs> yeah, that was a head on a mantle. We killed the national. Yeah, we. Uh, I did it. I I did a story on on uh, them winning the championship because I wanted I wanted to kind of have that on uh, you know just being able to cover a championship team for the first time in my career." And uh, even though it came on the night that uh, the paper had disbanded, I got obviously a bittersweet situation. But uh, yeah, Michael was, but he was still in those days. Uh, and Mark Vansell, who was also on our national staff, remembers Mark would work for the Sun Times. Mark can tell you what's, you know, Michael was just a kid and I didn't really know a lot of people in the Chicago area, mm-hmm. but it, he and Mark had, had forged a little bit of a friendship. And he calls Mark up one night and he says, um, can, can I bring over some beer? Maybe we can grill out. Or, you know, and really? Mark said, hey, that, that sounds good. I'll get a couple of steaks. So Michael Jordan comes, comes back, you know, to Mark's place and they grill steaks and have a couple of beers. 
<laughs> that was Michael Jordan uh, before the last dance, right? Uh, wow. He, uh, yeah, it, and that's how much that you know. You talk about a transformation. Um, he, uh, and it, it was inevitable, you know, it was just inevitable right. that he would I not. I mean, he went on to become a global figure, right? Yeah. And then, and the world of media changed to the point where it was 24 seven. In those yeah. days, you could have a conversation with a guy like Michael Jordan and it might not be yes. anything you quote him on. You just have, have right. a chance to talk. He knows where you're coming from, you know, where he's coming right. from and you'd establish some kind of working relationship. Yeah. Or, uh, you know, a lot of times, I know Bob Verde, who was covering uh, the sports columns for the Tribune in those days, and Bob, a great writer, by the way, and, a, and a good, uh, an old buddy of mine, but Bob would love golf, and was Michael was sort of getting into golf at that point. And I remember Bob, Bob would go in the locker room and talk with Michael about golf all the time. Hmm. It was just something besides basketball, and he enjoyed the, obviously enjoyed the conversation because he's still, I think, um, he's probably out playing golf as we speak. Right. Like we should be. Yeah. Right. Uh, but, um, yeah, that, that, that just, that just, um, uh, that didn't happen later in his career. Yeah. And, uh, but, uh, Hey, he was, to me, he was the greatest player that ever lived. And that comes with the, uh, situation, right? Right. Exactly. You're not going to call friends over to grill steaks when you're a global icon. Right. Another guy that you got to cover a lot who became like a global name, like an asteroid streaking across the sky, was Bo Jackson. And I think he was in Kansas City when you were writing in Denver. So there was a time where you got to see a little bit of Bo in action in two sports. Did you ever get to know Bo? No, I, I never got to know him, but I was able to interview him once. And right at the beginning of his Kansas City career, and I remember uh, he had an infield hit and a, I want to say a home run or a triple. You saw the two facets of Bo Jackson in one game, the speed to be able to beat out an infield single and the power. And uh, to me, he had Hall of Fame potential in two sports. Uh, and I'm not sure it's, and we can go through the great athletes of all time, uh, but who had Hall of Fame potential, I don't know if anybody had what Bo had in terms of uh, of that. I mean, if he had stuck with football, which is a big if because of the hip injury, was sustained in football. But my God, he was, he was as good a running back as there ever was. And if he had stuck with baseball, which I think in retrospect, he might have, you know, they did come down and told him what's going to happen. He would have, chosen baseball and he would have hit 700 home runs. Struck out a bunch of times too, but you, you make up for it with your home runs, your speed, your, and, uh, what that great, obviously, uh, legendary throwing arm. Anyway, I talked to Bo in Kansas City locker room. And in those days, players were assigned al alphabetically, right? Mm -hmm. So Bo's locker was next to Danny Jackson, who was a pain in the neck. And Danny Jackson uh, sort of interceded on the interview. I would ask Bo a question and Danny Jackson would say something smart ass to interfere with the, with the process. Not cool. Almost call for the PR guy, but then I don't know. I just, I just thought, just, I'll just soldier through it. Mm -hmm. But um, you hate to wish ill will on anybody, but uh, when, when Danny Jackson would give up, the occasional home run, I would smile. Oh, we had those, right? I know a writer who we used all to have had an those, all. Yeah, I, had, I know a writer who used to have an all plane crash team that he would put guys <laughs> in certain seats and move them up the front to the right. to the front if they uh, were particularly egregious in yeah. their actions towards the media. So <laughs> I got what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. And Bo, of course, was not as great as he was Heisman Trophy winner and all that. He did not have the cachet in the locker room. He didn't feel to stay, to tell Danny, shut up. I'm doing this, you know, just mind your own business. He was kind of shy and withdrawn. Not, I mean, just socially a little bit awkward mm -hmm. and nice enough, but did not feel like he had any kind of room to tell a veteran to, to you know, shut up, right. basically. Right. Well, let's move on to Tacoma because there's a guy there 
in Seattle, 45 minutes up the road, who in some ways was like Bo and that his talent was such that, you know, it just drew everybody in. But he wasn't always somebody who always wanted to deal with the media. And that's Ken Griffey Jr. You know, Jr. could be hot and he could be cold uh, as a media person, which I always felt like, okay, that's fine. You know what I mean? You, you deal with him on his own terms that way. But obviously his talent was so prodigious and he really just lit up the Pacific Northwest, right? Yeah, his sheer, his sheer talent and everybody uh, saw that um, his persona was a little bit confusing to fans because everybody thought he was happy-go-lucky. He wore the cap backwards and, and had a very photogenic smile. But um, no, there was, there was some sour notes there and he could be, exactly, he could be hot and cold. And by the way, win or lose, sometimes after they won, he would be a no comment guy. And you're kind of thinking, Jesus, you know, uh, Ken, you guys won the game. Right. You hit a home run. Um, it's okay. Right. And we had uh, kind of a interesting relationship. And, and one, one of the big moments of, of all that mem- memory wise, Todd, he had hurt his <laughs> wrist, broken his wrist, making a spectacular Spider Man like catch in center field at the Old Kingdom in the middle of the 95 season. It was Memorial Day weekend. He had to have surgery and he was going to be out for about two months. And he comes back, uh, the, the rehab goes, you know, post-surgery goes okay. But now he's just got to come back and, and just get in major league shape in terms of timing. So they assign him to Tacoma, the AAA team of the Mariners. And Ken did not want to be in Tacoma. He had mm-hmm. never played AAA baseball. And he kind of took that as a matter of pride uh, that he just skipped it all, you know, because he was too good. Right. But they assigned him to Tacoma and he came down on a Friday afternoon with his, uh, it looked like his bodyguard and friend and confidant and came in and a lot of people had gotten no- noticed that he was going to be there for batting practice and were there autographs, sign this ball, um, take a picture, whatever. And he wanted none of it. Hmm. And he walked right by everybody. He didn't say hi. He didn't, he didn't shake hands. He acted like, as Ring Lardner once wrote, the side dish he didn't order. Hmm. Uh, hmm. You know, the, the, the fans were just, get out of my way. So I saw all that. And then I w- wrote for the Saturday morning paper what a jerk Ken Griffey had been. Uh, pretty, you know, pretty, pretty blunt. And, and he was a very popular player, obviously, but I just saw, I saw how he kind of treated the fans and, and, uh, and I wrote about it. Right. Well, later that night, you know how sometimes you, you, you retrospect, you kind of reflect. And I remember sitting uh, uh, somewhere, probably in a, well, not probably, I was in a bar. Hmm. Imagine and, that, John. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Was I there and with I you? Thought, <laughs> yeah. And I thought to myself, God, I might have been a little, I might have been a little hard on him. Uh, but hey, what the hell? You know, he's, he's a grown man. He can, he can handle it. Don't, you know. Right. So the next day the paper comes to my house and I, uh, un- you know, the, the rubber band, take off the rubber band and, and the column is there. But it's on the front page. Uh oh, A one of the paper. A one, Griffey is a jerk. Is that the headline? <laughs> Something like that. Wow. Uh, yeah. And there's and, your mug. <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh yeah. So Saturday comes and goes, and then uh, nothing happened. I uh, Sunday morning I get a call that uh, come to the come to the stadium. Uh, Griffey's going to play because he had no plans on playing. So he did suit up, he did play. But before that, he wanted to talk to me. Right. And uh, I, I walked in and got George Carl was there. He was then was coaching the Sonics in, in, in this little locker room in, in the, at the AAA stadium. And, and Ken, just let me have it. And he made, asked, you know, yeah, he wasn't offended, but he said his friend was. And to apologize to his friend, and I said, "Sure, 
you know, I, we shook hands, but he, he really let me have it. And George Carl, who I always respected and admired and thought he was a great coach, but George said something to the effect of, boy, you just can't trust these media people. Oh, and I thought, George, you know, stay out of this. Uh, right, right. But Griffey ended up uh, going one for three that day. And that was kind of precursor to a lot of other things that happened. The story ends, by the way, kind of, kind of very, very happily. At least in my, for me, I was invited to Cooperstown to his Hall of Fame induction. Uh, and there was a party uh, for him. It, 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 Cooperstown's so cool. I don't know if you've been there, but, uh, but the whole weekend is wonderful. Mm-hmm. And I saw Ken and he was, you know, dressed up and saw him and shook his hand and said, congratulations. He said, thank you. We shook hands and smiled. And that's the last we've talked. But uh, yeah, a very interesting, tumultuous at times relationship. Well, that's the way it is for columnists sometimes and a, and a superstar in a market. It's just not always going to be wine and roses, nor should it be, right? Yeah. And I, if I could do things over again, I'm not sure. Maybe I would have been a little lighter on that Saturday morning column. but. Um, there are a lot of layers there. Well, Junior wasn't the only person who defined sports in the Pacific Northwest, especially professionally. The city of Seattle has been blessed with some great moments, some great players, teams, Supersonics. You forget that. The Supersonics were there before they went to Oklahoma City. The Seahawks, obviously. You've covered a lot of different things over the years as a columnist in Tacoma in your homeland out there. What sticks out more than anything when you think about all those years? Well, the Mariners, I, I was I was new to me in terms of, of this team that I had never really knew anything about. And their stadium situation coincided with with everything, right? They they were desperately trying to stay in Seattle with the threat of moving to Tampa Bay under consideration. And so they were playing, the team was just playing to win. But the organization and the fans and everything else that was playing to survive right. and, to, and, to, and to stay here in Seattle. And that became, I think, one of the, uh, one of the great fun runs I've ever been, a, been privileged to cover was how they made the playoffs. Uh, and it, it was just delirious. It, it, you know, they were down 0-2 to the Yankees and ended up winning three straight in the, in the Kingdom. And, and it just meant so much more than than just winning and getting to the playoffs. It meant keeping the team here. As it turned out, they had a public vote that lost, but they went behind closed doors and it worked something out to the extent that a lot of fans were mad at them for essentially circumventing the politicians, circumventing the vote, right? Uh, the, the, it lost very narrowly and probably would have succeeded if, the, if they had voted the next day or the next day after that, but they had a lot of mail-in votes that said no. In any case, covering a team that was, that was playing not just to win, but for the ultimate stability of keeping the sport in town was, was pretty, pretty amazing. The great news is that the Mariners were able to stay in town. And I wanted to ask you quickly about the other franchise in town that has drawn so much attention over the years, and that's the Seahawks. And I want to ask you, one particular moment, because as a columnist, you can't find any more red meat than on February 1st, 2015, the Super Bowl, Seattle loses to the Patriots 28-24. Now you're sitting there in your press seat. There are 26 seconds left. The ball is on the one-yard line. The Seahawks have this monster back in Marshawn Lynch, the beast. Pete Carroll just give him the ball and you're going to win the Super Bowl, right? What was your thinking when you saw that scenario unfold? Horrified when <laughs> I saw him, I saw Russell line up, Russell Wilson line up in the shotgun. And I'm, what is, what are we doing here? <laughs> and then he's going to throw the ball. What are we doing here? He threw Todd to the like fourth receiver on the roster. Oh, it was nice of him to go through his reads in that moment, yeah. right? There's a reason the guy was a fourth receiver, right? And it went through his hands, and then, of course, uh, it was intercepted in the end zone, and, and that's that. I do remember looking at the monitor 
and seeing Pete Carroll with both hands on his knees and this astonished look. And I was kind of, kind of kept waiting on what's he going to do now? Uh, because every button he'd pushed to that point had worked. And mm-hmm. it, what's he going to do now? And, and instead his reaction was, <laughs> yeah. So I, to- total had, surprise. He, he had nothing left. It made for a very easy column to write. I always thought, man, you still, there was still a chance. The ball was like at the one foot line inside the one. Hey, maybe you get a safety. Stranger things have happened. Mm -hmm. And then they have to kick off. You could actually call for a free catch. Right. And then if you call for a free catch, you get a free kick. And all all, all that was still in play. Obviously not entirely plausible, but certainly possible. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Michael Bennett was offside, as he always was, or not always, but... Enough. Enough. And then the ball is, and then that, that's it. That's the game. But they came, uh, it, it's interesting, Todd. It, it has become synonymous, almost having Marshawn on the one foot line or one yard line has become synonymous with the ultimate failure when success was so close. Right. Around here, it's kind of a buzz phrase. Right. A, hey, we had, we had Marshawn on the one foot line. What happened? I know when, as a writer, when you're sitting there and something that starts to unfold right in front of you, you're just, you're almost like everybody else. You're like, what are you doing? You're overthinking this. Yeah. Sometimes during the Super Bowl, there is so much to cover and there's so many other people, especially if it's your hometown that's in the game, there's, you know, eight people there. Right. And you're all kind of running over each other, c- covering the same thing. But the be able to see it right in front of me. That was a that was one where I didn't miss my deadline. Uh, <laughs> right, yeah, right. Yeah. You didn't miss it in any of those four time zones either. <laughs> yeah. 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 I would say that was a quite uh quite easy. But I'll let's do it. Another uh Super Bowl that, we, that I covered was Pittsburgh and the and the Seahawks in Detroit. Mm-hmm. And what happened there was interesting. We had all these people, none of us was watching TV. And nobody at the desk was watching TV. As it turned out, there were some officiating calls that John Madden had an issue with. Right. And talked about it. And it became a national story. Unbeknownst to us who were at the game, it didn't hear John Madden talk at all. And after that, I always said, hey, we need somebody to watch the game on TV. Right. Just to you know, you employ all, uh, all these people Let's let's just make sure we're we're covering what the nation is talking about. Exactly. What was interesting is the next day I asked Mike Holmgren face to face. I said, "Hey, there's been a lot of talk about the officiating. Do you have any second day thoughts on it?" Now that he said, "Actually, the only problem we had was with the uh, fans being given the terrible towels, but there was no equivalent for what the Seahawks were." There were no kiosks selling Seahawks souvenirs because that was a little unfair. But as far as the officiating, no. <laughs> well, that was the morning. That was, I want to say, Monday morning or, yeah, or Tuesday morning. And uh, no, Monday morning. I'm sorry. They get back to Seattle later that afternoon. They have a rally at the stadium. And Holmgren says, I didn't realize we had to play two teams yesterday. The <laughs> yeah. one, one in gold and black and the other in stripes. So somewhere between when I asked him uh, about the officiating and when they landed, I think he, he <laughs> also saw the John Madden comments. He could have used somebody watching television too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, uh, but uh, underscores the, uh, uh, the premise that if it happens on TV, it happened. And if, Nobody saw it on TV. It didn't happen. Well, John Fogarty once sang, I know it's real or I know it's true because I saw it on TV. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I know what, John, this has been a great time. Um, you, you took the buyout in 2018 and I just want to wrap this up and, and pay tribute to you for overcoming some of the health challenges that you've had. One of the reasons I was joking around about losing touch with you is uh, you had a lot going on. You know, in late 2019, your liver disease was diagnosed and, well, you tell it. Well, you, didn't, you didn't know what was going to happen, right? Yeah, I, I actually, I'd had a, uh, some 
persistent stomach ache that wasn't terrible, but it was persistent. So I finally went into the uh, clinic and just said, I have a stomach ache, expecting them to give me like two pills and come back Wednesday afternoon. And, and instead, they kept me there that night. And after a bunch of tests and tubes and crazy drugs and weird dreams, and six days later, I was told that I had six months to live. And I thought, wow, that's, that's, uh, that certainly hastens the, hastens the process here. I thought I, you know, thought might have a few years. Yeah. Talk about deadline. Yeah. Right. So that was, uh, that was quite a wake up call, I guess. And, uh, I got all, everything all set to transition into the, uh, the next stop as, as they call it or whatever the euphemism is. And I had actually uh, uh, some nice folks that came over, not denominational, but basically social workers who wanted to talk about, you know, the journey, right. all that stuff. And uh, got my will in order and ready to go. The Lord take me. And uh, never got the call. So I, here I am, three and a half years later. Uh, I also got hit by a truck. Yeah, in February of this year, you're crossing the street yeah. and a pickup truck runs you over, yeah. John. What the hell? I'm still hanging and and uh, and loving each day and appreciating each day and thinking uh, I'll get called when it's time to get called. But for right now, it's uh, it's all good. Well, let's make this an afternoon deadline, one that's way off in the future, and I'll, <laughs> I'll join you then. I obviously, I'm so glad you're on the mend and doing better and still with us. I, I know I miss seeing you on the road. We had some good times together covering events over the years, and this has been very enjoyable to to catch up once again. Todd, I certainly enjoyed it. I uh, And I applaud what you're doing uh, for our business. And uh, it's just a wonderful way of keeping up with the uh, the characters and the friends that I accumulated over the years in this wonderful business called sports writing. And uh, congratulations to you for keeping all of us kind of in the loop. Thank you, John. And remembering and recalling what wonderful uh, jobs we had. Thank you very much and cheers. You too, buddy. Thanks for listening to Press Box Access. You can find us here with a new episode every other Wednesday. If you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to subscribe and follow us on Apple Podcasts or on your favorite podcast app. We'd love for you to review us. Five stars would be nice. Follow us on social media. Drop us an email at pressboxaccess at gmail.com. And be sure to spread the word. Everyone is welcome here. This has been a production of Evergreen Podcast. A special thank you to executive producers Michael D'Aloya and Gerardo Orlando producer Bill Hoffman, and our audio engineer, Nathan Corson. I'm your host, Todd Jones. It's closing time. Rock on. Greetings from Evergreen Podcasts. We're rolling out a listener survey, and we want to hear from you. The information in the survey will help us gather statistics and in turn make our shows more appealing to advertisers. I know most people don't like ads, But this is one of the only ways our shows make money and help keep their lights on. We promise it will only take a few minutes, but the impact on our podcasts will be tremendous. As a token of our appreciation, we'll randomly select one lucky participant each month to win an exclusive merchandise package from Evergreen Podcasts. Head to evergreenpodcast.com slash listener survey to help a show and possibly get some free stuff for doing so. We can't thank you enough for the support. Now back to the show.